And I, I, I find it kind of um, humorous, I'll put it that way, when, when people say, uh, when, they, when they laugh at, um, you know, the Genesis account that God spoke the universe into being. Yeah. Basically, they, you know, that idea is just ludicrous to them. But it's not ludicrous to say there's there was this thing called a singularity, which yeah. was the <laughs> smallest thing that there ever was. Yeah. And out of this smallest thing that there ever was came all the particles, all the forces, all the um, matter mm-hmm. uh, in a universe that now, um, you know, expands to 40 or 70 billion light years or whatever, you know, the length of it is that they've calculated now. Yeah. So uh, how is that more okay <laughs> i know <laughs> or, i know or more believable <laughs> doesn't make sense hi everybody welcome to mind the shifts i am anders balling there is a growing body of research that is challenging the 300 year old uh, materialist paradigm and it's happening in psychology, it's happening in, in uh, physics, it's happening in chemistry, biology, astronomy, all corners of science. And as you know, we've been talking about these things a lot on this podcast. And when you are into these kinds of topics, you sometimes bump into very interesting people. And my guest today, I discovered, uh, is somebody that I discovered on, on Medium. Uh, the blog, blogging platform where I sometimes publish stuff myself. And I was very intrigued and impressed by um, what he had written there. Uh, he has articles on science, nature, spirituality, and history. And he's also published videos like the last one, which is entitled Consciousness and the Invisible World. Welcome to the show, Gerald Barron. Well, thank you very much, Anders, and it's a pleasure meeting you on Medium and, and, this, and this means as well. Thanks. Yeah, it's great having you. And, and as I said, I mean, your, your texts on Medium really resonate with me. And I mean, the part of me that wants to, uh, has this hope of, of a bridging of the gap between science and spirituality. And um, so I, first off, I mean, what made you decide to start writing these things and publish, publishing them on medium like this. What was it in you? Well, um, you know, I, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm approaching my uh, 70th year <laughs> and I would say this is a lifetime interest. Um, I was um, born and raised into a Christian family uh, and attended uh, Christian private education, actually all the way through, through graduate school. Uh, and so I, uh, you know, certainly have, um, been gifted a Christian worldview, but also, um, you know, living in and being educated in this uh, society and and sort of participating in, in, in this culture, you realize that um, there is a very different mindset than uh, that, that exists. Uh, I call it a worldview um, that exists between, you know, what, um, what we understand to be a Christian or biblical, what I call biblical theistic uh, worldview and, uh, what you've referred to as the materialistic worldview. I, I refer to as, as physicalism. So, um, it's been a so lifetime. So what would be interest. the difference between physicalism and materialism? I, I, I don't really create any difference. It's, okay. uh, it's, 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 uh, I know people use different terms for it, but it's really the same thing. And just to define that in my understanding, because people have asked me that on medium you know what my definition of that is yeah. and that's the the worldview is simply a physicalism is that there is nothing other than the matter and forces that we find through science in uh, in our universe mm. and you know so the fundamental question that i've been dealing with is is there something more uh is you know does does reality what is real that's the ultimate question Mm-hmm. And um, does reality go beyond matter and forces, or is that is it defined strictly in those terms? And that question has interested me all my life. Um, now that I'm uh, mostly retired, I have uh, you know had some time, more time to pursue it a little bit more intensely, and started writing on Medium with uh, basically my own exploration of the questions of um, how does physicalism, you know, is physicalism true? Mm-hmm. Is that what science actually teaches? Because science is the ultimate authority in our world today. Yeah. Uh, and 
uh, how does that relate to a biblical theistic worldview? And so that's really what I've been, uh, been trying to wrestle with myself. And it's a beautiful, great question, and we're going to delve deeper in, into that. But uh, tell us a little bit more about your situation, where you where you live, and what you do right now. You're in you're in a uh, little bit north of Seattle, Washington State, yeah, United I'm, States. I'm, I'm in the far northwest corner of the United, continental United States, basically right on uh, right off from Puget Sound, uh, about sixty miles north of Seattle, in a uh, beautiful little town called Mount Vernon, Washington. Mount Vernon. Okay, and you're a grandfather of nine, and married to Lynn, and. Uh, that's right. Lynn and I have been married for 48 years, for which I'm wow. deeply grateful. Amazing that she's uh, put up with me for all this time. Uh, we have um, three amazing uh, grown children and their their families, their spouses, and nine grandchildren. Our oldest uh, is 18, and she recently um, moved to New Zealand because she was born in New Zealand. So she's a, a, a New Zealand citizen and found a uh, wonderful young man over there. So um, we're sad to leave her. But so we have uh, nine grandchildren between the ages of 11 and 18. Oh, that's great. And you have some connection with the other side of the world then also. Right. Yeah. Because of Beautiful these, country. Yeah. Hope to see it again soon. Yeah. Yeah. I've never been there, but I'd love to go. So and you um, you're, you're not quite retired, but semi retired or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I've, I've, I've done a number of things in my life, including I was a uh, university teacher for about four years, uh, got into business, mostly in uh, marketing, public relations, got into uh, software for crisis communications. Um, and so worked with a lot of major companies and government organizations. And so even around the world on crisis communication, emergency management, that sort of thing, uh, retired Oh, about, uh, or sold my businesses. I had a couple of different businesses at that time, sold those, but then, um, I guess got a little bit bored and, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, I, uh, I grew up in a farm family. I'm in a farming region. Uh, farming is in my blood. My, uh, I'm, um, I'm a second generation Dutch, by the way, you probably didn't know that Anders, but mm -hmm. my father emigrated from Holland after world war II. Okay. Uh, he grew up there during the war. And, uh, so we have a, a rich Dutch heritage of dairy farming in our, in our uh, uh, blood. Yeah. And so I got involved in uh, uh, forming and running um, some nonprofit organizations aimed at saving family farming. In fact, that was the title of it, Save Family Farming in Washington State. There's an awful lot of um, political pressure on farmers. A lot of people really want to um, alter how farming is done and even uh, in some cases get rid of farming in areas like Washington State which is really sad and, and, uh, and, and uh, disturbing. So I got involved on in that as an activist. Uh, so, um, and I've been doing that for about six years, but recently retired from my role as the executive director of Safe Family mm. Farming. Mm. But you're still a farm, a family farm advocate? As you, as I, I, I'm still, yeah, I'm still working with the organization. How do you define that? If, if you're a farm advocate, how, how do you define that? Well, um, my job um, and my focus has been public communication. So uh, I also own some business uh, or some uh, monthly magazines. <laughs> so okay. you come from a journalistic background, so you can, uh, <laughs> I think we can relate in that way. Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah the, what, what I really brought to it was a, a public outreach, public communication um, side, believing that uh, political decisions ultimately reside with the voters. And a lot of anti-farm at, activists um, were saying a lot of things about farming uh, that aren't true. And they are. There's a lot of false information about today's farming and not really realizing how much farming has changed and is changing and how serious farmers are about sustainability and about doing the right thing. Mm. So um, really, my job was to help correct some of the uh, misinformation, false information that the media, and I hope we do talk about the media a little yeah. bit because they play into the hands of activists very easily when activists generate the outrage that they need in order to generate audiences. And so uh, that's, yeah, that's the role sorry. of counter activism is a really important one today. And farmers don't necessarily understand that, but it's essential for their survival. Mm. Very interesting. I mean, I'm a little bit involved in the, the forestry business here in Sweden mm. right now, because I'm, I'm doing some, some work, some work for them. Uh, Doing, uh, helping them with with some podcasts actually oh, okay uh, and and also writing some articles and and i i'm hearing uh, um, similar stories from their side that that the, the narrative in the media about 
how forestry is being done is not correct and it's uh, it's a lot of lot of misunderstandings about it so it's i guess it's about the same same problem yeah and what what's difficult is that people in forestry are farming uh, probably farming more than that because farmers they're independent uh, business owners and uh, you know they've they're multi-generation usually they just want to farm so to say hey you got to get involved in the uh, public de debates about what is uh, what is correct and and help uh, correct some of the misinformation it's not something that they really want to do but no, i think uh, the younger generation is really starting to understand that if they're going to survive as farmers they need to start speaking out and speaking the truth Mm. Yeah, as you say, we will we will talk about journalism and the media, the news media in particular, uh, a little later, I think, in in the in this um, conversation. And as you say, you you um, have uh, I mean, we have some kind of connection there um, when it comes to journalism. You haven't been working as a journalist yourself, but you've been working with communication and PR largely, and uh, crisis communication. And I know you you wrote a book or maybe a couple of books about journalism or about how the media works uh, and it was for business people i guess i, I know yeah. the t title of one was uh, now is too late which is right. a title that i can really resonate with <laughs> well that was a book i wrote in uh, actually the first the initial version was in 2001 mm -hmm. uh and when i got involved in selling the crisis communication uh, platform that we were provided that we uh, you know we're providing to major companies um it was clear that um, these companies needed to understand the media environment that they were operating in uh, better, in especially in terms of the speed of communications that really came about through the internet. And so um, this was yeah, about- This was almost 20 years ago. So, I mean- Yeah, right. Yeah, we started this and we built a platform in 1999. So we were a little bit early, especially given that it was cloud-based at that time. That was really early for that. But Very. Um, it was so- um, the, the message of now is too late is that if you don't prepare for dealing with them for a major crisis, uh, when it happens, <laughs> you're going to be uh, so caught flat footed that you're never going to be able to recover. So mm -hmm. that's what that's what this. And then I wrote a later one actually published that um, um, oh, about two or three years ago called Black Hats, White Hats, why activists almost always win and how to defeat them. And that really uh, has to do with activism and the role that they play with the media, with um, uh, sort of white knight politicians uh, and plaintiffs, lawyers, and really affecting major change, often without um, the facts behind them. Mm. So that was that was the uh, the other book that I wrote on that. Okay, subject. very interesting. Yeah, let's get back to that. So, Gerald. What is the nature of reality? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Put you out on a limb. You, you don't have to you ask me. <laughs> when you figure that out, will you let me know, Anders? <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, I think a uh, couple of more episodes and then we'll have it all figured out. <laughs> no, we don't have to. We don't have to start in that end. But I, just as a segue over to, to, to that <laughs> kind of topic. Before this interview, you, you told me or you mentioned... Uh, by way of um, things you wrote uh, to me that that um, you, you told me about decisions and aspirations in your life that were hinting that, as you have already been been explaining, actually, that this interest for the borderland between science and spirituality was was there all the time, all along. Um, and you mentioned that when you were the boss of a uh, investor controlled company, you made some bad decisions, but you don't really regret making those bad decisions because they showed you the difference between who you really are or were uh, and the um, who you sometimes thought yourself to be. In, in what way can you explain that? Oh, that's a, yeah, you're asking some great question, Anders. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, reflecting back on, you know, my business career, um, I've been an independent business owner for, uh, you know, for 40 some years. And, um, and there was uh, one, the business that I referred to earlier, the crisis communication business or the crisis, uh, you know, software business that we got involved in, we got some investors in and some, you know, some, some money people and, um, and it, you know, on re in reflecting on that, I realized, and, and through other experiences, my son uh, was involved in that business, and then he started another business after after I sold that uh, related to it. And what we've both seen is that 
the people who are very, very successful at, <laughs> at making a lot of money and as you know, really making things happen in the business world have some characteristics um, that um, you know, contribute to that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of positive characteristics that contribute to it. But part of that is, you know, a, I guess a willingness to steamroll or other, <laughs> over other people, um, lack of empathy a lot of times, a, uh, you know, a single mind and dedication to, uh, to making money and to, you know, and to being successful. Uh, and I realized if I had more of those characteristics, I think I would have been far more financially successful, but I don't think I would have been um, as successful, <laughs> if mm. I can put it that way, or, or, blessed or, or, um, you know, enjoyed the benefits of, um, of not being that way. So for example, uh, you know, certainly in my business in dealing with, um, companies all over the world and certainly all across the country, um, there was plenty of opportunity for travel. Well, travel no, never really worked very well for me in my marriage and in my, um, in raising, you know, three children and things like that. So I, I, I did very little of it. I did, you know, a fair amount of speaking uh, at conferences and things like that. But my wife would come with me wherever, you know, where, whenever that was possible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's sacrifices that were made. I, I remember a decision, one of the, re referring to your question. One of the key decisions I made um, about um, staffing, about someone who was, you know, in our office um, that I probably should have fired, but I didn't mm -hmm. uh, for for reasons for who I am mm -hmm. and somebody You're else too in that position. For that. <laughs> well, yeah, for for various reasons, including you know looking out for some some other inter interests as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. So when I look at things like that, I realize no, I I never had that um, the necessary drive or focus or capability or um, those things to, to really make it mm -hmm. big. I certainly had the opportunities and, but it's not, it's not anything that I regret. But did you realize then at that time when you, when you saw the, when, when this happened? No, uh, no, not, not, not sufficiently. No. Um, you know, I took a Myers-Briggs test when I was in my forties and realized um, it helped me to understand with some of the um, weaknesses that I had that I never, that I was blind to. And that was really helpful, but um, you know, it didn't, it didn't stop me from, I'm, I'm, I'm not a CEO type. I'll put it that way. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm much yeah. more of an artist, <laughs> artist okay. and writer. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, um, not paying sufficient attention to that, you know, led to some of the, the issues that I'm talking about. Mm. But do you think the personal traits of most CEOs, uh, are a problem that they i mean that the, the structure of the system is such that that it, it encourages certain kinds of people that maybe aren't as well uh, good as they could be uh, the, they have the some poster, bad traits yeah the poster child for that is steve jobs i mm -hmm. mean steve jobs has been uh, named you know uh, one of the top business people of all time yeah. And yet anyone who had personal dealings with him, uh, you know, had amazing stories about what an absolutely horrible person he was, oh. how, how he treated other people. I mean, I uh, early on in my career that I was dealing in the computer industry, I um, I talked to one of the people who worked directly with him, actually designed the initial Apple logo. Mm -hmm. uh, and the stories that I heard, and that was Apple was even, you know, hardly even heard of at that particular point. But so, you know, complete. Uh, lack of empathy, you know, almost sociopath in terms of uh, dealings with other people. And yet you talk about the focus and you talk about the, uh, you know, the, the intensity and the brilliance and, you know, um, yeah. That, but those, some of those characteristics I've also seen in people, they were, on, you know, some were on my side. I, I look at some of these people who were involved in my business, uh, you know, as investors and as board members. And um, yeah, I, I admire their uh, skills and their focus and their intensity. Um, but I don't necessarily want to be one like them. No, some people say, think that, that the, the, the number of the, the proportion of psychopaths is much larger among bosses than, than the general population. Maybe that's true. I don't know. Well, I think, I think you can say that probably across different careers. 
mm -hmm. know, so if you, you know, whether it's uh, being a teacher or a preacher or a, a, a politician or, uh, you know, there's, I, I think you're going to see people who are, um, you know, remarkably successful a lot of times share. Now, that, that's not universally true. It's unfair to say that. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that anybody who's successful uh, has, is a bad person, not at all. <laughs> But I think that they that there's some characteristics that um, are are really necessary to. to do you think to, so? Do you, know, do you think it has to be like that? We live yeah. in a fall, fallen world, in my worldview. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, and, but part of maybe you we know, can change it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's and it, yeah, it's the uh, it's the old question of. Uh, uh, you know, the capitalist system, for example, is, is terribly flawed. The market yeah. system is terribly flawed. And yet yeah. it has generated wealth for a great many people, including, you know, <laughs> um, so, but some of those things, they, it, you know, it works in, in so many ways because of people's um, greed <laughs> and, uh, you know, willingness to do what it takes, you know, to get what they, what they knew, which is exactly why it needs to have moderation and needs to have some controls mm. uh, because um, that you, we see that today in the, in the, uh, in the tech world, I think is that things have, have really, I, I was just reading yesterday in wall street journal about um, the uncovering of uh, Facebook documents that show that they knew things that were going on that were not good and not helpful, but Zuckerberg was afraid of having a negative impact on his business. And so ignore, you know, to me, that's, yeah, Zuckerberg fits, fits that model. He's not willing to make some decisions that have to do with um, ethics and morality mm. uh, because of um, it might affect his stock price. Mm. So that that's, you know, a, you know, a pretty current example. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know what you're saying. And, and uh, we, we have the same kind of problems and the same kind of, structures here in Europe, in Sweden, but I think it's more salient in the United States, perhaps, this capitalist uh, system. But I think it's hmm, it's so difficult to understand how people can, can put up with that. I mean, you, you, you uh, took the consequence of, of realizing that you weren't a CEO person and you did something different and, and you took another path in your life. And I'm, myself, I've, I have been uh, a boss on a medium <laughs> level, mid-level uh during a few years but i didn't really like that that was really me i mean i i could do it i could I, I knew how to do it and i had i was responsible for a group of people there and i had to uh you know negotiate their salaries and things like that which i really hated but i i knew how to do it but i didn't want to do that so i i left that and then i i have even quit my my steady job uh last year now so i'm on on my own <laughs> freelancing so I, I think it's so difficult to understand how people can put up with this and just uh, join that, that rat race the, in the hamster wheel and, and uh, you know, yeah, the hierarchy of it. Because, I mean, we are so educated now. People are so informed and so know so much about everything else that's happening in the world and everybody else in the world. And so how can they, how can they accept these structures and these hierarchies? I, don't you think that somebody, something's changing here that it's crumbling a little bit at least <laughs> yeah and um that I, I agree i mean i think one of the things that we share an interest in anders is um i think that we both sense that there's some deep changes that are going on in our world and certainly mm -hmm. you know we see that in politics uh, we see that in our country you know uh, a huge divide that i think is 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 true in europe as well i think it's playing out on a more um you know uh, kind of accelerated level yeah. in, in our country but it's it's um and you know a lot of things you know we look at those things politically a lot uh and um you know personally i don't i don't think a lot of the answers that people think for making a better world are necessarily better answers <laughs> you know i have some you know questions about the wisdom of a lot of the direction that that's going but i think what one thing and i i read your last post on medium or at least i think it was your last post but mm -hmm. which helps explain mind the shift a little bit better. Yeah. Um, but I, I think one of the things that, um, you know, we have found that um, is of mutual interest and connects us a bit is uh, understanding that um, while these things may play out politically, that's a really surface level of what's going on underneath. And the more I read about science and philosophy of science and 
things like that, I really, really come to believe, and I think you do as well, that there are some major um, paradigm shifts, so I'm going to use that term, but also just, you know, um, that, that is going to, I think, ultimately ref, um, be reflected in significant changes in worldview. And the, the materialistic, physicalist worldview of, uh, you know, the past 300 or so years that came out of the, the scientific revolution, I think is, is um, uh, you know, the, the foundations of that are crumbling. Hmm. Uh, and scientists, for the most part, know that. I was watching an interesting podcast the other day about a, uh, conf- a biology conference and evolution in, uh, that took place in, in England a couple of years ago. And basically, evolutionary biologists understand that neo-Darwinism is a failed, uh, <laughs> a failed theory right now. Yeah. But, um, but that has, that's far from being understood in the general public. Yeah, but it's starting. Uh, it, it has to start in that end, I guess, and then it has to yeah. s- spread. Do you know about the the Galileo Commission? No, Galileo Commission. I I interviewed actually. You can listen to that. I think it's episode fifty seven on the podcast on Mind the Shift. Uh, David Lorimer, who is who is heading that oh, Galileo Commission, mm. and it, its uh, task is to 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 yeah to uh, spread this this knowledge that there is a, a ch- there is a change in the in, changing paradigm within the mm-hmm. scientific community and it's it's nearing the spiritual realm and this is actually happening and and they are working with um, uh, connecting with scientists and philosophers and other other academic people around the world who are are uh, doing these kinds of things and and uh, and uh, enhancing this this uh, bridging so I think it's it's a really really uh, uh, laudable uh, endeavor they're, they're doing there. Mm, I'll uh, check that out. That yeah, Galileo Commission, David Lorimer. Yeah. Mm. It's exactly what you're talking about here, actually. Yeah, there seems to be all, you know, a number of signs of it. I'm not sure if you've been uh, reading any Bernardo Castrop. No, I haven't, but, uh, <laughs> haven't been reading any, but I've, I've seen, I've listened to him on, on podcasts and interviews. Yeah, so you know, there's, there's, I can point to a number of examples. Robert Lanza. The, oh yeah, I read his book, uh, Biocentrism. Biocentrism. So yes. there, there's, you know, I. But again, I think we're we're a long ways away, a generation or two at least away, yeah. from general public really understanding that um, what they've been told about science, <laughs> that science teaches, whether it has to do with neo Darwinism or the origin of life or the origin of the universe or all of those sorts of things. Um, Science doesn't have an answer for those things, and the answers that they're finding are are very much conflicting with the uh, the uh, with the message that, that that has been provided. And there's there's a few voices out there still that are um, very much defending the physicalist uh, viewpoint. Brian Greene is a particularly eloquent uh, writer. I don't know if you've read any of his books. But no, I until haven't. the until the end of time is is a um, is a poetic defense of physicalism, but it's it's um, it fails miserably in my mind in terms of, uh, of, of defending that. And there's uh, indications in there that he, uh, he, that he understands that. Yeah. Um, Sean Carroll is another one that, you know, that's in they've, uh, many of these have gone way past Richard Dawkins. They've, I think they consider him counterproductive <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to yeah, their yeah, efforts. Yeah. yeah. But um, uh, yeah, this is one of the greatest things that you do on medium. You, you read so many books and you review them and you, you, Tell tell the readers why they are good or bad, and you. I mean, you reason around them, and that's. I mean, that's really. Well, in my humble opinion, of course. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's my... really helpful because I mean, many of us don't have time to read all these books. So I'm just grateful that some some other people do, and and can. Well, that's the benefit of retirement. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's just uh, it's just kind of sad you have to wait that long. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, so uh, and and you had uh, also told me beforehand here that you had an aha moment uh, of of sorts when you you read about Carl Gustav Jung's view on how uh, a human can be of service to God or to the universe or whatever you want to call it, the whole. And his view was that we contribute perfectly to creating the whole simply by having a unique perspective, which we can all understand it, that we actually have. So, and to couple that with science, I think it was John Wheeler. You have mentioned John Wheeler many times, I think, in what you've been writing. 
I think it was him who said he who said that um, the universe is is a giant uh, feedback loop, and and uh, so so we are actually just uh, you know f- giving feedback back to the universe, and the universe has contact with us. Are we? Do you think that we are? Would you describe a human being as as an antenna with constant communication with the universe? Um. Yeah, I well, yeah, that that gets to a sort of you know um, you know basic idea of of uh, universal consciousness, for example, which is something that's being explored. It seems more and more, but Carl Jung's idea of our self reflection being basically our service to God, uh, you know, he he wrote this prior to I think really the deep understanding that we have today of quantum mechanics, yeah. and all of these writers that we've been talking about are really um, dealing with, uh, you know, what's called quantum foundations are really trying to understand, you know, the Copenhagen school um, basically said, shut up and calculate. They didn't say that. (laughs) It's like, don't pay it, you know, don't bother with what the philosophy of this, what, what this really means. Let's just make this work, which obviously they did. The world we have is as a result of their success in that. <clears throat> but now others are really kind of coming to grips with what what does it mean mm-hmm. that um, a particle exists in um, here, there, and everywhere in, in no position in all positions until it's observed. Yeah. You know, um, Martin Rees said, Sir Martin Rees um, said that uh, something to the effect that, you know, the universe might have been created billions of years ago, but until it was observed, it wasn't really there. And so there's, um, you know, what we found is that the conscious mind, wherever that is, and whatever that is, has a role to play in bringing reality into existence. Now, you put that together with what Carl Jung's idea was, that um, that when we see, when we observe, when we reflect, when we exercise our conscious minds, we're in effect, in effect bringing something into existence that we, wasn't even possible before that. You know, you get people would, you know, theologians might say, well, all, all, you know, to God, all things are possible. And yet Jung has a good explanation why, um, no, it's not possible for God to have, uh, to, to necessarily, um, uh, you know, see and experience exactly what, uh, you know, a unique individual and a u- unique mind would do. I won't sort of try to explain the theology of that, but um, the perspective is really interesting and how that connects with quantum mechanics is something that really um you know interests me a lot uh, i think personally when i say it it was because you're you know one of your great questions was have you had an aha mo- a moment well now when i reflect on on the universe <laughs> i sit in my uh, patio overlooking a beautiful view over uh, this golf course that we live on uh and and see the you know the morning sun coming up and um, you know, the beautiful trees and uh, in the spring, especially the birds singing. And I reflect on, on the universe that we have. And I see that is my own perspective. Mm. That is my own viewpoint. And in that, to that degree, I'm bringing the world into being in, yeah. in my own mind. And because I believe that it is God ultimately who brought those things into being, including my mind, it becomes part of um, his reflection in bringing the world into being. Yeah, and I think that's actually what John Wheeler was, uh, well, what one of his most important contributions, contributions wasn't what I just said. It was more like, um, more to, um, along the lines of what you are speaking of now, that we are actually creating the universe when we are observing it. So every time, for instance, a scientist or a group of scientists discover new, uh, for example, new particles, even smaller particles than they have discovered before, they are creating those particles because they are they come into existence when they are observed. Uh, so that's how he looked at it. And it's a little bit like what you are talking about here. And this also means that we are all the center of the universe. So that's 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 the way. Well, you can express it different in uh, different ways, I guess. But we're all yeah. Um, and of course, the um, uh, you push that one to the extreme, and you end up with solipsism, 
uh, which I don't <laughs> think any, any of us want, want to go to because, and, and that, that gets into then as well, the interconnectedness, which is something you, you mentioned just a little bit ago, you know, we're one of the, um, um, interesting things about the, uh, science, uh, mindset, the physicalist, uh, worldview is, and, and doc, I just was watching a podcast with Dr. Rupert Sheldrake. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him. Oh, but yes. I've listened a lot, to a lot of uh, his. Uh, okay. one, of, one of his books is called The Science Delusion. But one yes. of the things that he said is that the materialistic physicalist worldview um, generates isolation. It generates a, a sense that, no, um, I am completely independent of anybody else. My, mm. because, because my brain isn't connected to, you know, <laughs> we're not seeing uh, wires running between, you know, my brain and your brain. And, and, uh, and so we, we have a viewpoint of us as being totally independent, isolated, disconnected. Well, I think the, um, the worldview that's more emerging is one of a much deeper connectedness. And whether you're talking about Bernardo Castro's idea of, of um, you know, the mind as a uh, flowing stream where we are each individual disturbances in that or, you know, little ripples in that stream. Somehow we're all part of that stream, which is, again, what um, both uh, Carl Jung, but all, also William James. I, I really, um, uh, I, and I need to come back to that much more, but William James's idea of uh, what he called the mother sea of consciousness mm. uh, is to me is, uh, is, is, you know, really starting to gain currency. And uh, I'm, I'm, this is what I'm planning on writing more in medium, but um, it's, it's interesting that, that Bernardo Castrop also said he found the Wolfgang Pauli, Carl Jung um, uh, conjecture, um, probably the best description of reality that there is. And uh, that that's something I, I wrote about about two years ago, or a year and a half or so ago on medium about that conjecture and thinking, ah, I think they're really onto something here. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've, if you've uh, seen anything on that uh, Anders, but no, it, not really. Not. I, I mean, I know about Pauli and uh, you mentioned Wolfgang Pauli and well, Carl Jung, Carl Jung together. Okay. Those two right. together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I read I, I read Carl Jung when I was uh, I mean like twenty years ago I read two or three books by Carl Jung but uh, nothing by by Wolfgang Pauli but I know that he's mentioned a lot in these contexts. Well, they, it's an interesting story because uh, Pauli had some um, some uh, relationship problems with his um, wife. I think it was his wife uh, he met at a, a cabaret. I think uh -huh. <laughs> she was a dancer and. Um, so he went to Jung, who was the you know the top psychoanalyst at the time, as a patient, and uh, of course Wolfgang Pauli was one of the preeminent, you know, the pioneers of quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. and so they started uh, you know talking about things, and they came up with this conjecture, uh, which they called, referred to as Unus Mundus, which is one world, and they said you know the dualistic idea of there's matter and there's mind, and the two are completely separate. Well, we've struggled with that idea for. Uh, actually well before the time of Descartes, but certainly Descartes, yeah. uh, with, with Descartes. And they say, no, it's not. It's one world. Uh, it's just that mind and matter both are, are two different manifestations of this unus mundus. And uh, again, I, I, it, I think the implications of that are beyond my capability, but it's really interesting to contemplate. And again, I look at it from a biblical theistic viewpoint and say, yeah, that makes sense to me because that unus mundus is the mind of God. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's how I would, you know, try to explore it and, and, and see if it works. If it doesn't work, then, you know, we, yeah. we know. <laughs> I would. Yeah, when I said that we are all the center of the universe, that I didn't mean that, that in, a, a, in an egotistical way, because I meant it in, a, I mean, rather the opposite, that we are all, we can, I mean, <sighs> Uh, to contrary to what many people think that are not spiritual are not uh, thinking these ways uh, they, they 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 tend to think that we are so small and insignificant that, that that life is pointless and meaningless because we don't we don't mean anything we're so small the universe is so gigantic that it doesn't really mean anything we, we what we do has no significance but what i was trying to convey here is that it has a lot of significance because Every perspective is unique and is needed f 
for the whole to come into place in a, in a way. So that's that's what I was. Yeah, that's to. that. Right. That's a great, you know, uh, way of putting going back to Carl Jung's self-reflection ideas yeah. is that the universe cannot be complete in that view without my perspective, without mm. your perspective, or without every the 7.8 billion people who are living <laughs> right now and the 70 some billion who have lived all have sort of contributed in a sense to bring the universe into in reality, into existence. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, I had the other day I had this this idea or I came up with this insight i i wouldn't say it was a, a an epiphany that's too strong a word but some kind of an insight that maybe there is only one life and i don't mean that we only have one life and then we die and it's all black i mean that there is only really only one <clears throat> life and we are 7.8 billion aspects of that life yeah you see what i mean that, that's right. a way of see, that's a way of thinking away the separation thing so if you Absolutely. see it that way then we can't be separate because there's only one ongoing pulsating life that just goes on and on and on in, in the whole universe and we are just all, we are just parts of it and that flower here in my window uh, and and uh, my dog i don't have a dog but if i had one and myself and you we are all aspects or expressions of this one single life that's interesting because uh i just picked up um um, the book by Fritjof uh, Capra, yeah, Capra, called the, yeah. The, uh, the, the Tao of Physics, and I've seen Graham Pemberton refer to it many times in his posts on Medium, and so finally, I, and then I found out that a uh, a famous um, Christian theologian of a generation ago, by the name of Moltmann, I believe, found Capra one of his uh, favorite uh, you know science writers. Yeah. So I, I I thought it was really interesting. So I picked that up, but it, you know. It, I, I've only gone a little bit past the introduction so far, and uh, but that's basically essentially what he says. And it's interesting because that's how also how I really understand um, Bernardo Castrop's idea. You know, everything is this stream or this um, yeah. mercury ocean. <laughs> These he has several different analogies for what he means by the mind, but we're we're all just aspects of that mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, I haven't gone quite as far, you know, I'm struggling with the issue and, and be interested to see what you think of that, Anders, as well. But there becomes a uh, question between is uh, idealism uh, reality or is, or is there such a thing as scientific realism? In other words, are there actually real particles or are all the particles simply a, a construct of what happens in our minds and in, and in that universe? So mind that's great a big question. question big and great question I, I i haven't i i couldn't answer it but uh i mean i'm open to i'm nowadays i say i often say that anything is possible and i'm not i'm i'm truly i don't think i am scared of whatever results may 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 pop up i mean uh it it, it is what it is i mean yeah it can be and, anything <laughs> yeah that's right and i think that's one of the um, the, the fact that you feel that way and, and I feel that way, uh, you know, to some degree as well, um, is that there's a ferment going on, I think. And I think that's is spreading wider and wider in term, terms of uh, what people think is possible. And, and you know, the, the door is open to the future in terms of, uh, you know, what the, what the mindset and what the worldviews will be. Um, Charles Taylor and his uh, book, A Secular Age, I don't, I don't know if you've read that one, but uh, it's uh, it's 800 pages of um, kind of mind bending reading, <laughs> but he talks about uh, with you know with the coming of secular humanism, um, the nova of ideas. He refers to it as the nova of ideas, basically uh -huh. an explosion, just like you're you're referring to of um, you know any it, what is real mm. uh, is is open today to. Um, you know, to a tremendously wide variety, maybe an infinite number of possible explanations. Yeah, and and that wasn't that wasn't true in uh, you know before the age of science, and it wasn't true during the age of science, uh, as or physicalism as that as that basic idea erodes. I think that nova is just uh, exploding. If I can use yes, that term. it is. I, I believe it is. And some people have been forerunners like Tesla and others. Uh, realizing things more deeply than 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 many uh, contemporary yeah you, when you realize when you read a lot of the uh, early theoretical physicists dealing with quantum mechanics and the comments that they make about it even about spirituality and god and religion and eastern religion and things like that you realize yeah. they were thinking through the implications of that 
but it was the physicalist uh, evangelists, if I can put it that way, <laughs> that have basically pushed those ideas, you know, out and say, that's not, you know, that's not acceptable for, for uh, science. No. And our, our culture has, I, I, I do blame the media a little bit <laughs> mm -hmm. coming from my background to say, and, uh, you know, you've probably seen a post or two of mine that criticizes when I see uh, articles that, that make these physicalist assumptions uh, and, and state as facts, you know, things that I are know. simply unproven, but they do that over and over and over again. And yeah, I tend yeah. to think, though, that, that the media and, the, and the, the powers that be are basically the same thing, really. I mean, two, two different aspects of the same, the same thing. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about uh, worldview. You have mentioned worldview several times and religion. I myself, I don't consider myself religious i mean you can it depends on how you define it of course but i personally i don't define myself as religious but spiritual which is what many people say these days maybe more so in europe than in the united states i'm not sure mm -hmm. anyway so that... uh might be like that uh, my mother though he, she, she actually uh, became a priest in the church of sweden <laughs> mm. uh, towards the end of her work life uh, i i left the, i ended my membership in the church of sweden just uh, earlier this year uh, which doesn't mean that I don't believe in in, in God or or you, what you want to call that, uh, as you can understand. But I I don't really mm, I have a difficult uh, I have a hard time relating to to many of the uh, traditions and dogma within Christianity. So, but you are, uh, as far as I understand, a pra um, practicing Christian. Is that right? Well, I don't know how to practice it. <laughs> I believe. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm a believer a in believer, the, in, in, Christian. In what yeah, I, you define yourself as a Christian. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I have no problem. And so, uh, so reading myself. so much, the, as much as you do about, uh, you know, the frontline science that steps into this spiritual area, which we've been talking about a lot here, how, how has that affected your faith, your Christian faith? Um, well, you, if you go back to a question you asked earlier about, you know, where my interest in this thing be, began. And I, I go back to um, high school. I went to a Christian high school, private, private Christian school. And I remember very clearly, in fact, I remember where I was when I was thinking this. <laughs> Just say, um, I believe that God exists. Um, but if the evidence shows that it's not true, I will not believe it. In other words, let the evidence, um, you know, lead me. To, to the truth. I mean, uh, um, Anthony Flew said the same thing, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I'll follow the evidence where it leads. And I was serious about that. And so I've long, and because, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, we live in a world, in a culture where there is a conflict between worldviews. If, if you're a believer, as I am, we, you know, we're, we're, we're taught certain things about what the Bible says. We certainly know that a lot of the things, you know, that I, that I grew up with, that, uh, you know, people have said preachers, teachers, whatever have said the Bible says, it's not true. <laughs> I'm not a young earth creationist. Mm. I am a creationist. I believe that uh, when Genesis says in the beginning, God created, uh, I believe that to be the truth. And I believe that science um, validates that. It doesn't prove it. There's no, you know, uh, obviously, as, as we were just talking about, there's a you know world available of different ideas about how the universe began or even whether it did begin. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's there's no definitive proof. But um, so um, I've been long interested in that question: what is real? Uh, is my is my Christian faith that I was um, you know gifted <laughs> as a child? Um, is that is that valid? Does it stand up to uh, to scrutiny? To both them. Um, you know, logical, rational, but evidential, um, you know. Uh, but has it changed in, in a way or is it, I mean. Yeah, I would say, you know, because in the last couple of years, even though I've, I have a whole library of books on science and that sort of thing. Uh, so I've long been interested in it. Over the last couple of years, really diving into it, I have found over and over and over again um, that, oh my gosh, this is definitely pointing <laughs> in a direction of support rather than opposition. Oh yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying that there aren't some things um, that uh, that are challenges to it. I'll, I'll give you one specific example and something I need to sort of work through a little bit. In our Western Christian um, uh, belief system, we do not believe in reincarnation. Yeah, um, but. Uh, 
I'll tell you, one of the most eye-opening books in the last five years that I've read is Irreducible Mind. Hmm. And um, uh, there's a follow-up book to that. I forget the title right now, but it was edited by um, Drs. Kelly, their uh, husband and wife team at the University of Virginia. Yeah. The, uh, the Institute the of Perceptual Study. Yeah. Dr. Edward of Kelly and studies, Emily yes. Kelly. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and they also um, have a, um, a, a, a department in there that a um, couple of professors, one of them was passed, but uh, Jim Tucker, I think, is the con- mm-hmm. current one yeah. that uh, um, studies um, reincarnation or, you know, the. Yes, it's really compelling what they what they come up with in their studies. Yes. And again, that doesn't fit my Christian worldview. Hmm. You know, we, we believe. So, in I mean, why, do, why? Why? That's I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why I think I, that I can't be Christian active, actively. I mean, I, I, I mean I'm, I'm convinced that a lot of the things that are said in the Bible and what almost everything that Jesus said, I, I guess, uh, is true. But, but Christianity to me is a, it's a structure. It's a, all the, the traditional religions are structures and dogmatic structures in many cases. Well, with the exception maybe of Buddhism, which, is re, which isn't really a religion in, in that uh, traditional sense it's more of a philosophy perhaps but i mean judaism islam uh, christianity they're all like structures and i i, I have I don't, I don't understand why i have to adhere to one particular structure i mean well, i can believe yeah, in god I, and I, I can believe in jesus i can believe in the buddha what what the buddha said and and just see the whole totality of it and and uh, feel spiritual <laughs> if you see what i mean well, yeah, and I think that's a problem that a lot of people have with Christianity or with other religions because they're different. There's diff- different aspects of it. Um, there's, you know, sp- religious practices, re- you know, structures. There's, uh, you know, hierarchies and all of that, and teachings. And what, um, you know, part of the process that you know that I've gone through in, in science, you know, the study of science has certainly helped to do that. Is say what is what is basic there. In other words, what. Uh, you know, I've heard preachers talk about what things you can hold with an open hand and what things you 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 hold with a closed fist. Mm-hmm. You know, what are, what are the closed fist items versus the open hand? Well, if you look at a great deal of what we have been taught within evangelical Christianity, which is what I was raised in, um, no, it doesn't fit. It doesn't even fit the Bible. <laughs> We're mm-hmm. seeing that more. It's you know, these are these are cultural um, developments. That we, you know, by years of going to church and listening to preachers or things like that, you know, you can you get that conflated with what basic Christian belief is. And then you find out, no, it's not basic Christian belief. Uh, And that there's far more in the Bible, for example, that we don't teach that we should be teaching. For example, um, the the, the Bible is absolutely alive with spiritual realities. (laughs) And not, I'm not talking about just God or the uh, the Trinity or things like mm, that, but mm. spiritual beings, whether you're talking about angels and demons. And but you know, Paul talks about powers and principalities and things mm. like that. Well, um, you know, the Bible takes those things very seriously, but you don't hear a lot of that. And <laughs> you know, so now as you start de- digging into the science and and looking at other religions and how they deal with it. Uh, uh, you know, um, I, I just, oh, the, the video you just watched yeah. about the, the yeah. visible world. I was responding in part to and, and Dr. Tim Anderson, whose work I absolutely love. And mm. so many of people on, on Medium talk about the, the um, relationship between Eastern philosophy or religion, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Taoism, that sort of thing, mm. and, um, and, and modern science. Yeah. What they don't, um, what I... W- what I'm reflecting on is that that was also Western yeah. in many respects. Uh, Greeks sort of took us in a, in a more dualistic direction. And then, um, you know, we've, it, be, it became, you know, uh, different in, but the big change was, you know, the age of enlightenment, the age of mm-hmm. science and the, the development of the physicalist worldview. Well, if you go back beyond that, where uh, Western thinking is very much uh, consonant with a lot of these things as well. Yeah, and it's, it's a very good point. And, and it's been forgotten and it's been uh, rejected by many people in the West today for, for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, it's but true. We, yeah. we, it, you just like what you were saying, you know, many, many people who reject Christianity, they reject the uh, the human forms of it without yeah. necess- with a, you know, and, and what I, what I think is, is kind of sad <laughs> 
uh, is it's, it's really a matter to me, a lot of throwing the baby with, uh, you know, out with the bath water, the bath water needs to be thrown out in, in, uh, you know, in so many respects. And especially mm -hmm. today as evangelical Christianity has gotten so caught up in the political divides in this country, mm -hmm. um, so much of that bath water needs to be thrown out. Um, but we need to be careful about throwing the baby out as well, because yes. uh, there's, a, you know, and that's kind of what you're dealing with. What is the baby and what is the bathwater? We that's also a, real a question, yeah. Clear, clear answer to that. And, and that's really, one of the things. That, mm, people have a hard time thinking many th just two thoughts at the same time. And, and uh, well, I, I tried to answer that in a post I did, recently did. I don't know if you saw that one on Medium, where I say, uh, which basically I tried to say, what is basic Christian belief? So um, for, for my own self to say, okay, what are closed handed things? What are things that I need to, yeah. you know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to ascribe as a biblical theist and say, the Bible um, is telling us things that are true, what are those? And then how does, not, you know, let's leave aside the bathwater, let's leave mm -hmm. aside all the forms and the structures and the cultural, uh, uh, you know, accretions over the years. Um, what is it that um, needs to be hold, held on to uh, in, in comparison to what we're learning from science? That's what, I'm, that's what I'm really trying to struggle with. And like I said, there's some challenges there when I'm trying to work through those. Yeah. But um, that's, 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 that's my fun job. Yeah, I think it's great that you're doing <laughs> it. And uh, I think uh, talking about the, the Bible, I think there's one book that is popular even with people who normally reject Christianity, and it's the book of Revelations, isn't it? John, the book, yeah, John's yeah, book of yeah. Revelations. Which yeah, is, that's one. Which contains a lot of uh, esoteric stuff and, and uh, not very dogmatic traditional christian yeah, it's very mis it's very mystical mystical yes that's and, the word and and yeah. mystic you know even uh Fritjof, uh capra's book is really about mysticism mm. and it's about the insights of from from mystics which i think is fascinating i want to look into that a lot more yeah. but another very popular book by uh by by non-believers in the bible is ecclesiastes uh -huh. okay. which is uh uh has some interesting perspectives okay should read the Bible more, I guess, and also Fritz of Capra, <laughs> and there's there's so much to read. So this is a big one here. I don't know if we can even have time to delve into it, but what's your take on evolution? Talking about Christianity and you, you know, it's not possible to deny evolution. Let me just be real clear on that. Um, but how do delta, you define the, evolution then? I mean, the the, the delta variant uh, makes itself very clear to us every day. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the process of evolution, which is um, how sort of changes occur, you know, in biological life, is a well established, and 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 Darwin was absolutely brilliant in pointing that out. Mm. Uh, my uh, issue is with what I call exclusive evolution which is that evolution is the answer to everything. Um, if, if, you know, it's an exclusive evolution, even it goes to cosmology because they see, uh, you know, the evolution of planets and, or in, and things as, as an evolutionary process, all following sort of the same basic principles. Um, but the, the key issue um, from a biological standpoint is, um, is neo-Darwinism an accurate reflection of how of the history of life and i say history of life from the earliest forms to um the forms of you know the wide diversity of forms that we have now and neo-darwin it's called neo-darwinism because it blended mendelian genetics um you know by uh, gregor mendel mm. with uh darwin's ideas mm. so they through genetics and especially through the discovery of dna in the in 1953 um they had a mechanism that could explain how natural selection would work. Um, in other words, natural selection, as uh, Perry Marshall just said on a podcast that I saw, only does one thing, kills things. The things that doesn't kill that survive, that's the only thing that natural <laughs> selection does. Yeah. But, but neo-Darwinists treated it as if, as if it's a creative power, as if it's the answer for everything. So they really have two aspects of it. One is random mutations in the, in the sort of the genetic system, right, that are then acted upon by natural selection. Um, those do not adequately in any way reflect what is happening uh, in, in evolution. And that is um, becoming more and more and more clear. There are a few, um, Jerry Coyne is one who is, a, and Richard Dawkins are, you know, probably the uh, most outspoken, Daniel Dennett, 
Uh, those are all great defenders of uh, neo-Darwinism, but they are getting to be more and more lonely. And you don't have to be a believer, you know, a theism. Uh, you don't have to be a believer in intelligent design in order to say, um, no, that's wrong. Um, I was just watching a podcast about the conference in England a couple of years ago. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a website called The Third Way of Evolution. And James Shapiro from University of Chicago, I think, has, uh, you know, has a lot of things. These are people who are saying, no, the random mutation um, theory does not work. Uh, Perry Marshall's book, Evolution 2.0, um, explains um, how uh, he calls it the Swiss army knife of, uh, of evolution. Mm -hmm. But he talks about five different processes, none of which are random, mm -hmm. that all have contributed to the evolution of life. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what's interesting is a lot of these processes such as symbi symbiogenesis um, mm -hmm. and transposition uh, and uh, I, can't, I can't remember all the five different things that were happening, all are uh, epigenetic. So it's a huge one, realizing that there is, um, you know, there are all these different processes that are necessary in order for evolution to occur. Now, the big question. And this is the huge question in evolution is evolution um, is dependent. Life is dependent upon a digital code, the digital code that is stored in our DNA. Without that digital code, life would not be possible. Uh, and that digital code is, um, you know, is remarkably complex. What, what do we have? Three, is it three million or three billion <laughs> uh, in you know in our uh, you know in our DNA? Even the even the simplest animals. You have mean molecules in the DNA spiral? Yeah, yeah. I can't remember how what the what the number is, but it's a lot. And the and the precision by which they must be uh, organized mm. is that's where the digital code is. You know, uh, and those are many examples are given. You can put the twenty six letters of the alphabet and scramble them together. Um, but it takes a, an intelligent mind to put them into a sequence where they carry meaning. And that's the basic question. Um, we have sequences of DNA, even in the simplest life forms that carry meaning or, or else repro reproduction would not be possible. Mm. So um, that's where the intelligent design movement comes in and say, well, there can, we know in science, we know of no process of creating meaningful code other than through an intelligent mind. Mm. So if we know of no other process, um, then science leads us to that conclusion. And I tend to be that, to, to go in that direction. I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm an intelligent design person, but I'm saying that the evidence for design, which even Richard Dawkins agrees, <laughs> there's lots of evidence for design. He just insists that it's all by accident. And it just says the appearance of design but that evidence of design is definitely there. Mm -hmm. What Perry Marshall's take is, and he's also a theist, um, is that the, um, uh, it's the cells that are intelligent enough, cognitive enough, smart enough, aware enough, conscious enough to make these choices and to, and, and to actually do those things. I'm not quite there with, uh, with Mr. Marshall yet, but the point is, is that science today, whether it's information science, or uh, you know, all of these other forms of evolutionary process have completely undermined the neo-Darwinian neo idea, but, these, but, the, but um, the public still believes it. Yeah. And the media, <laughs> you know, science reporting, still is reporting as if, that's an, as if it's established fact. Yeah, and yeah. so it'll take, it'll take a long time for people to understand. So the media is 20 years behind or maybe, maybe even more. Yeah, and it's not, it's not necessarily their fault because the loudest mm -hmm. voices, for example, um, on Wikipedia, and I love Wikipedia. I mean, I think it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, but it's but run it, by materialists. It absolutely is. And yeah. there is, uh, I've understood, in fact, one of the co-founders of Wikipedia has, I've had, a, had a, I saw a quote by him complaining that when it comes to physical science, yeah. there is an organized group. Yeah. That is trolling uh, Wikipedia in order to. They're hunting down uh, to, all these people who are trying to. to yeah. Rupert Sheldrake, for example, the, yes, who's a, yes. a brilliant and scientist. Kim Van I, I interviewed Kim Van yeah. who's written about near death experiences. Oh, yeah. I've, his his I've, website, his Wikipedia, he's, he said that I don't even. I, I don't even try to change it anymore. It's there's no point in it because it's. Yeah, it's, they're they're organized the in yeah. in uh, in protecting their idea of the truth, which is mm -hmm. not true. And, 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 you know, to tell you the truth, that's one of my main motives for doing what I'm doing, because good, yeah. what, what, 
you know, how are we going to combat this unless, you know, uh, there are other voices that are. <laughs> yeah, that are we have to, to raise our voices and we're doing it right now. Yeah, we're doing that's, it. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So it's the random thing that is the problem with evolution. There is a, there is evolution in your view, but there is there seems to be a driving force behind it, an intelligent driving force behind evolution. And that, I mean, yeah, it, it couldn't, have, right. couldn't have come about just randomly because that's too if you calculate that, it would simply never happen because it's too complicated. It, I mean, lightning striking down into the the you know the primordial soup where there were some molecules and all of a sudden there was the DNA. Uh, it, you know, it's it, it's important, <laughs> Anders, to separate. There's there's two main questions yeah. in life and the evolution. Of At life. least one is how. Yeah, one is how did it begin, and yeah. then how did it evolve? Yeah, and um. Well, they are they are connected, of course, but yeah, yes, and and the physicalist answer is there's chemical evolution, which answers the origin of life, and there's mm -hmm. biological evolution. Um, the but the more they have, uh, what I've seen and read a fair amount about this, the, the more um, if they find out about the complexity of life, and how absolutely remarkable life is. Uh, the 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 goalpost of um, coming to an answer through chemical evolution keeps moving farther and farther out. Yeah, yeah. It's it's looking more and more like alchemy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, for hundreds of years, uh, the best scientists in the world pursued the idea that they could turn lead into gold or do these other things that now we know and we say how stupid of them. That's not possible. Well, we're spending billions of dollars on something that I am now convinced based upon the science is alchemy. It's not yeah. possible. Yeah. It doesn't, it just doesn't, I don't care how many chances there are across the entire, uh, you know, span of the universe. It mm -hmm. isn't possible. That's what I think science is telling us. Now and that's if, a different yeah. issue than, yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, but I mean, if, if there is a, a unified field, if there is a quantum field and more and more scientists are are accepting that that is probably the case that everything just, I mean, the, the tiniest particles aren't even particles. They're just, I mean, um, uh, they're just energy spinning around uh, and, and it, there is, there is a, a field that connects everything. Then these, I mean, it doesn't really make sense to, to talk about, I, I don't know what I'm, I'm just babbling here. Well, you, <laughs> well, I think you're getting at something that, um, that I'm really starting to uh, think about some more. And that is, you know, if you look at a lot of the, the where people are going today, who, who are accepting that the physicalist notion is false, is, is, and is no longer viable. Well, um, you know, what are alternatives? You know, accident, chance, um, you know, that doesn't play out very well. Um, so a, a lot of the references are to force, to a force field, to, um, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, um, un unexplained um, um, method there is, you know, even Plato, I think, uh, in, a book, in a book by John Leslie, uh, you know, um, talked about there being, a, you know, at essence, a creative force. Yeah. Well, you know, that to me is, a, is one of the real crucial questions that I think we're going to face in the next few generations. Is it some sort of impersonal force? Is just something that uh, you know that is part of the entire scope of, of the universe and what, everything that there is that has the capability through um, you know through it's an, an impersonal uh, uh, thing that pulled it pulls these things together. I think that that's certainly an open question. Yeah. Personally, I believe design uh, in, implies intention, and yeah. intention uh, implies will, and yeah. will implies personality. Mm -hmm. a person and 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 so to me that's a much more logical rational conclusion to come to say so what is force and where does the force come from and how mm -hmm. can you explain the force uh so um you know maybe the force is with us <laughs> but i i think that that force is best defined as a mind that um that intended yeah. <laughs> this to happen yeah intention i think is a very good word here that's a crucial word, pivotal word, because, I mean, go back to the Big Bang. It's a theory, but most, I mean, even most uh, physicalists believe that Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago. And if you think about that, how can they explain that that happened in the first place? And it, what was it, if not intention, that made it happen in the first place? It was just a singularity. It was just 
nothing. And then all of a sudden it was everything, everything that we know in the universe originated in this first singularity. And we are all, and this is also something that I've been thinking of, could be perhaps a, seg, uh, a way of uh, connecting with people who are materialists and who don't normally uh, think in these terms that, I mean, they can, most people can accept that the big bang happened. And when, when you can, you can kind of uh, uh, connect around that, you can, I guess, make them understand that in that sense, at least, we are all connected because it's, it's undeniable that we are all made of the same stardust from, from the beginning. So right. that's, I think that's, that could be a, a possible way of, I mean, uh, speaking to people who are normally not interested in these things because the Big Bang is, is really something that you can, you can bring up in these discussions. And, and, yeah. and uh, they have a problem, I think, uh, explaining that in many yeah. respects. Well, if you've watched, Dave, you, you know, uh, you, I know you watched that one video I sent you, but I've got six videos in that sequence. And that's one of the first ones is, you know, um, the importance of the beginning. Yeah, I got to I got to watch that one. So, you know, to, to me, it's it, it is really important. And I, I, I find it kind of um, humorous. I'll put it that way. When when people say uh, when they when they laugh at, um, you know, the Genesis account that God spoke the universe into being yeah. basically they, you know that idea is just ludicrous to them but it's not ludicrous to say there's there was this thing called a singularity yeah. which is the <laughs> smallest thing that there ever was yeah. and out of this smallest thing that there ever was came all the particles all the forces all the um, matter mm -hmm. uh in a universe that now um you know expands to 40 or 70 billion light years or whatever you know the length of it is that they have calculated now yeah. so uh, how is that more okay i know <laughs> or, i know or more believable it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense to me to, to me to, it makes to, first, to first different sense between the, yeah say, yeah that you know mm. i don't know how it came about but it certainly seemed like um it was intended let's talk yeah. a little bit about society now and uh th there is much talk about i think we have touched upon it a little bit much talk about polarization these days of course and um the United States seems uh, in a way to be, you know, in the eye of the storm here. I, I think differences between countries are overblown mostly, but uh, at the same time, I think what happens in the United States is probably more or less instrumental to, to what's happening globally, because after all, I mean, the U.S. has seen, it's, it's black and white here. It's seen both as a, as a beacon of hope and as a cautionary tale for the rest of the world. So mm -hmm. I think what's happening, what, what happens in the United States is very important. And we know that how divided the country became during the Trump uh, tenure, of course, and uh, it hasn't, as far as I understand, become less tense now during the pandemic with the debates about the lockdowns and the vaccine mandates and all that. So how, how have you experienced this firsthand? I mean, living in, in the United States? It's a, it's a big uh, question, but it would be nice, interesting to hear you elaborate freely on, on it, just spontaneously. Well, um, one thing, uh, I, I guess, uh, <laughs> I tend to um, avoid as much as possible the, uh, you know, the uh, politics, what's happening in the world. I don't, uh, you know, I've basically turned off the TV except for watching the Golf Channel. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, th I think that's why. I, uh, I don't, I don't watch, uh, you know, any of the news. I do, I, I do read Wall Street Journal. Uh, that's been my, you know, um, my primary source. And one of the reasons I do is because uh, there's a great difference between their editorial coverage and their editorial writing, their editorial mm -hmm. page. Okay. In fact, uh, a year or so ago, the editorial writers, the journalists um, revolted and, and threatened to go on strike if the publisher didn't fire their editorial page writers because there was such a difference of opinion on this and uh the of course the publisher rupert murdoch uh, did not uh, fire them and the balance between the two uh and you know even the editorial is not as um is not as balanced maybe you know it doesn't it certainly isn't as um 
maybe far left as New York Times or you know some of the other ones are, but, but there is balance there, and and that's really interesting to me. Yeah, I didn't know that. I mean, I mean, I knew that Robert Murdoch was was the owns the paper, but I didn't know about right. this, this company. Yeah, they uh, so it, it, you know because they're reading the same news <laughs> they're reading the same story they're getting the same sources of information yeah and to see um one take and you know what what the headlines say in the wall street journal versus then what the editorial page writers come up with is it, it's pretty interesting so that's kind of a microcosm in a sense um ultimately i think um the conflict, you know what what i see in the united states is that you, the u.s overall is becoming much more european Mm -hmm. uh and we live real close to canada I have a lot of good friends in canada i used to do quite a bit of business in canada and canada is sort of uh i see uh, one step between yeah in terms it is of yeah, political, political mm -hmm. and theological ph ph philosophical mm -hmm. and of course um you know one of the great differences the um, american exceptionalism as the economists used to call it um had to do with religion and we're seeing uh, i'm a i'm a fan of karen armstrong um, the writer on on uh, religion, and she wrote a book a number of years ago called uh, "Oh, I've, I've, it was on fundamentalism," and she looked at Jewish, Christian, and Islamic fundamentalism. Say, what are the common themes here? Uh, and really, it, fundamentalism is a reaction of sort of an extreme um, portion of a group when they see their um, their belief system losing hege hegemony <laughs> mm. in other words if if it's if it's been a dominant view accepted within culture and they see it eroding then there's a there's always a small group that re responds in a most extreme way in some yeah. cases in a lot of cases violence and that's what was happening in saudi arabia where al-qaeda came from because what they were seeing is the westernization of um, their Islamic culture. Yeah. So they were seeing movies, they were seeing women starting to drive or you know, if it changes an attitude toward uh, w women and things like that. And they said, uh, wait a minute, we got to stop this. And, and their response is typical of fundamentalism. Uh, I see Richard Dawkins as an atheist fundamentalist because he sees that atheistic physicalist viewpoint eroding Mm -hmm. And it scares the it's heck out of them. Threatened, yeah. It's, it's very then there's always a counter reaction. That's what's right. what happens. So to me, that's a big part of the divide mm -hmm. um, that's going on and the extremity of the divide. They are huge worldview differences. They're, you know, uh, and, and it ultimately it comes down to worldview and religious uh, viewpoints that are driving that. But I also see... Um, whether, you know, whether I agree with it or like it or think it's a progress in the right direction is a different question. But I, I see the overall stream of it becoming much more European mm -hmm. uh, and 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 the, the reaction that we're seeing from, let's say, the right is one of, uh, we, you know, fits that fundamentalist mode. Yeah. Um, so. OK, so what role does the media play here? Now we come to the media <laughs> <laughs> in this polarization and and all that. Well, one of the challenges is, what do you mean by the media? I mean the news uh, media. Uh, I, I, yeah. Well, I, in, well, I, I in, guess that in the was 2016 a rhetorical election, question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. My, 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 my point is, is that the news media has completely fragmented. And even in the 2016 election, we knew that 40 to 45 percent of the people got their news from Facebook. Um, so social media, the Internet, you know, websites. Um, have become hugely uh, important competitors to the traditional news media. It's not that, and, and they have certainly they've lost money, <laughs> they've lost funding, and they've lost resources. Um, but they haven't necessarily, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that they are uh, irrelevant, they're far from irrelevant. But a lot of what's happened with the traditional media has been uh, is is a direct result of the um, huge competition that they have from non-traditional media. If I can just call it maybe new media versus traditional media, yeah. Um, and and so that drives a lot of it. Now, um, this this was my business, <laughs> yeah, uh, for for many years. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that's very clear from the research about what what gets people's attention, why do people uh, tune into, um, you know. Babies farting on the internet, and uh, um, you know, and you, you know, and cute cats and things like that, and uh, and and humor. 
Um, why do people tune into it? And all the research shows emotion uh, is what attracts attention and what creates memory. You know, our, our, the emotional impact of something is something that uh, has a lot to do with what memories we actually store. Uh, but the news media, they know that instinctively and probably <laughs> rationally as well, emotion sells. So I, in the books that I wrote, I talked about FUDO, fear, uncertainty, doubt, and outrage. That yeah. is the currency of the news media. If it's not creating fear, if it's not creating uncertainty, doubt, or outrage, and outrage is the, per, is the preferred one. So um, that's how they, you know, you look at the, at the stories, uh, whether it's a pandemic or oil spills or, um, you know, uh, politics, if it's, if it's not driven by one of those things, it's really of little interest. And the reason is that's how you get eyes on the screen and that's how you sell advertising. And that's how you stay in business. And so, um, you know, if people understand that, then you can, uh, and, and, and that's true of social media as well. And in many respects, it's much more true in social media. I remember a survey that economists did, um, oh, probably four years or so ago, it said the politicians that were most extreme on both sides and said the most extreme things and had the most extreme views were by far the most successful on social medias. The ones were uh, I, did, I didn't want to make a comment about how activists fit into that because uh, activists are really a, a necessary element of the media environment because they feed the outrage. And the media, this is one of the things that I would be most critical of media. They don't really care that much about whether it's uh, and I'm not now talking about traditional media yeah. journalism. They don't really care that much about whether it's true or not, because if it if it um, if it generates outrage, if it it meets their need. Now that's an extreme statement, an extreme generalization. I know that there's an awful lot of wonderful journalists that are very concerned about you know being accurate and being truthful. But I've been involved in numerous situations where an activist will make some claim, and they'll they'll repeat the claim. The, the good stories will say this, this, um, you know, you know, this accusation was made by so-and-so, or they won't put it that way. We say this organization says such and such. Um, other ones will just take that and state it, take it as a statement of fact. Mm -hmm. One of the big problems is the headline writer is usually not the reporter, right? It's usually a copy editor that writes the headline. Uh, and they will take those things and summarize those being, and the, and the most, attractive, you know, eye attractive thing, emotion attractive thing is what's going to, uh, you know, is what's going to get played. Yeah. So activists really feed into this and they know that they're very, very skilled at this of creating information, statements, accusations um, that, uh, you know, usually they, they um, uh, you know, rep it's what they, what I call the 10% or the 90% lie. There's a small amount of truth to it that is expanded to something that is uh, far greater the golden so, thread of truth yeah and you know and the question is a big yeah I, I think you you said it i mean that's exactly how it works and as you say journalists love to to pick up what activists say and it's also uh, a matter of good versus bad and that's part of the um, the dramaturgy the the drama the, the journalistic drama right. well interesting well i don't i don't know if you read my book now it's too late but that's one of the things that i talk about is the melodrama um uh, method or, you know, basically uh, the structure of so much news reporting. And I equated it to um, 60 minutes coming into the scene. 60 minutes was the first news program, journalism program yeah. that, that was um, in uh, put in prime time. So it was journalism there for the first time to compete against gun smoke and, <laughs> and sitcoms and, and things like that. And they adopted what I call a melodrama style, which is they have good guys and they have bad guys and they have something they're fighting over. Well, they're always fighting over some form of the public good. That's the maiden in distress, right? So they got the black hats and the white hats. And, um, and, and that's how they structured these stories. And they made it dramatic and they made it uh, intense. And, but the truth is usually neither black nor white. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. always more nuanced than that. Exactly. And that's what, that's what has sort of gotten lost in that process. I know. So, you know, my, my book, Black Hats, White Hats, says, well, this is how activism works. And this is why there's so even a small handful of activists can be remarkably effective at, at uh, making huge changes, partly because the me new news media gets a hold of it. The politicians read the headlines and they say, oh, this is what the public cares about. And so we take action. 
And you say, how do you fight that? Well, there's only one way, and this is uh, against most PR um, principles, but it's something that I've practiced um, and found very successful in my work with the farmers, is that you have to switch the black hats. Uh -huh. Somebody in this news environment, somebody has to wear the black hat. The activists work to put the black hat on you. If you don't turn around and put the black hat on them, um, you can't wait. A gray hat strategy is what is common, which is what to say, well, we're not really as bad as they say we are. Mm -hmm. That's a gray hat strategy. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, that doesn't work. Gerald. Where can people find you? you you're on Medium. Is there an address there? A website? Uh, it's just, yeah, what are the, I forget what the uh, website is. If just you go to Medium, medium and, and, and yeah. search for Gerald I do put some, uh, some articles and posts on my website, grbaron.com. Uh, okay. And uh, I have a, you know, like I said, I'm an artist, so I have a bunch of paintings and some of my writing up there. I'm a little bit, little bit behind, but I do post up my videos there too. So if anybody's uh, interested in those, um, I'll probably keep doing those for a little while. Uh, and they're, they're under uh, the tab for, for writings. So you can find them there. Wonderful. It's been lovely speaking with you and good luck now with your continuing investigations into the borderland between science and spirituality and everything else that you do. Well, I hope we stay in touch, Anders. It's been a great visiting with you, and I'd love to pick your brain. Maybe I'll have to do a podcast and uh, return the favor. Wonderful. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. If you like this video and other interviews and talks on Mind the Shift, please like, share, and subscribe. I appreciate all the support. Thank you.